Hello and welcome to the Found Cause. We found our cause and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I am Michael, the man behind the machine, and to my virtual front is Sebastian, the poker keeper. Hey, Sebastian, how's it going? Pretty good, and you, Michael? It's a beautiful day outside, sun shining. You can see it's a brighter room. I have I didn't have to like go into the cave today. We've gotten a, a different system, so I can keep my glasses on. And when I turn on my main monitor, which is over here that you can't see, it doesn't blast the the light of God into my face. It blinds our viewers, um, so I can actually look up scripture while I do this. So ever increasing on this whole video podcast thing. However, in that spirit, I'm going to read you a quote from said monitor, and then we'll discuss it. Four point three degrees of warming would mean $600 trillion in damages from climate impacts. $600 trillion is double all the wealth that exists in the world today. Our agriculture would probably be about half as bountiful. So the same plot of land would be producing about half as much yield in a world that we would have at least 50% more people to feed. The UN estimates for the number of client, Simon to, uh, client refugees that could be produced just by 2050 on the conservative end, their estimates are 100 million climate refugees. That is a quote from the New York Magazine and is not unique amongst all the environmental warnings. People have been saying things like this for years, but in particular, these days, I think the last 20 years, global warming has become the climate child, the, the environmentalist cause. And from what I've seen, Sebastian, and you were saying before this episode uh, that you've seen it too, there's a lot of people in the world that buy into this, especially in the United States, but also in the church. And we're going to talk about the problems with this, and they're not probably what you think, but we're also going to talk about how Christians should approach environmentalism because it's not all bad, right? And what I want to say on the outside of this episode is that this is definitely not going to be some just tree hugger bashing, you know, we hate the squirrels and it's time to turn everything into a coal plant episode. I'm, you know, I'm conservative, Sebastian's conservative, but I think we that side of things often gets a bad rap for just hating the earth, but we don't. And as Christians, even if conservative Republicans hate the earth or something like that, which I don't think they do, but even if they did, we as Christians are called not to, right? And so we'll talk about the bad side of environmentalism, the bad side of Christian environmentalism, and then the proper view of the Christian environmentalism and what it should look like, and then how we even go about talking to our neighbors about it, our friends, our Christian friends, our secular friends, and what's the best ways to evangelize in those kind of communities? Because it is more or less a portion of a religion, the whole environmentalist movement. So first things first, and Sebastian, I'll, I'll toss it over to you. What's your experience with, wh what do you think is the biggest banner issue for people who are wrongly environmentalistic, who make it their religion? They, the the biggest red flag, for me at least, has been that they say that planet Earth is out to get us for all the damage yeah. that we've done. Mm -hmm. That is, to, to me, it's like, whoa, you need to take a deep breath and reevaluate the things that you believe in. So that's, for me, the biggest thing. More tame than that, I would say, when you're uh, so concerned about the environment, would be things like what we eat, how we do, should we, should we ha get rid of cars? Should we just abandon all types of coal, gas, and just move on to electric cars? And uh, that's it. Electricity can be wonderful. You could, you know, harvest resources in new ways, by all means. But it is really the intention, as we're going to talk about, behind these claims that they're asserting. Same with... Uh, that life is all going to end in 10 years and then it just keeps getting postponed most of the time and another 10 years and then another 10 years. So it's a lot of paranoia. I would say a lot of fear that the world's going to be like Mad Max as we were discussing before the episode. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to dive into that attitude more than this, more than the claims necessarily. Yeah. And unless you've been living under a rock or some sheltered place, or not, maybe not in the United States, I don't know how it is in most other countries, but a lot of Western countries are included in the United States' paranoia about climate change in particular. I think that's the, the number one thing, but it's not just that. I mean, we all know the old stereotype of hippies who are certainly not particularly Christian, usually new agey, more into Mother Earth, like you were mentioning, that they were into, you know, hugging trees and protecting forests and wildlife and animals. And I think that's a cleaner image of environmentalism that the enemy, that is the devil and demons, did not want to put up with, right? Because 
as you can you can trick those kind of people into worshiping nature which is of course is idolatry and evil but it's much more damaging if you can get people to worship nature still be talking about mother earth and and she, her heart and her being hurt by our actions and other things like that while also advocating policies that are bad for people because old hippie ones about protecting streams and clean air and protecting wildlife usually don't harm people um, to a very large extent and usually are, are just general good stewardship of the environment however i think the difference today is that and i really do believe it's a push by the enemy because he has a lot of influence in people's lives to redirect what could have been a good impulse of people to protect the environment and instead redirect it to at the most is futile efforts and at the most it's actually harmful to their fellow man efforts to combat not just climate change but i think a slurry of issues uh, one of them is veganism and vegetarianism that connects these days it's all connected to climate change because i guess that's the mother issue but vegans were around before climate change was a particular thought uh, or theory or fear of people but these days if you watch even tv burger king just put out a kind of kind of kind of amount of farts and burps because that contributes methane huh. to the atmosphere and that will cause global warming so essentially they're doing their part to stop global warming and so it's, it's, it's clearly in the culture right and again I don't, I don't think anybody's not familiar with the arguments of that side right because it's so prolific however i want to break it down and we're not going to get into the the heavy duty science because i think and you agreed sebastian that it's it can become really contentious because we've got our sources and of course climate change fanatics or, or advocates have their sources and it can end up just being a statistics quoting game and we could make this a statistics podcast and talk about people's research methodologies but that's would be a whole episode and i don't want to do that so the general gist is if what they're saying is true. So if that quote that I gave at the beginning of the episode is true, the the success and the thriving of mankind, which has largely been because of innovations in agriculture, right? Planting on more land, using industrial fertilizers to produce more food on that land, and then power, being able to give people not only modes of transport, but also electricity and non-wood burning fuels and other things like that have contributed to human well-being and flourishing wherever they go, right? Happened in the Industrial Revolution in Europe, and then it spread to this continent via colonization, but also the rest of the world via either colonization or just, just the embracing of modern technology and globalization, right? People are lifted out of poverty every day, tens of thousands, because they switch from burning wood fire in their home to burning oil. And then they switch from burning oil to having electricity and from um, coal powered electricity to cleaner forms of electricity, whether it's hydro or solar or nuclear or whatever it is, it's cleaner than coal. And coal, believe it or not, is cleaner than wood burning and wood burning is cleaner than dung burning which is something that some nomads do sometimes so you can see that this has been a technological boon and has allowed humanity to expand everywhere it's gone right it's benefited thailand it's benefited the united states it's benefited england it's benefited china it's benefited the middle east you know it's benefited every everyone everywhere it's gone but the narrative is that this is actually a poison a deep rooted poison that all of these modes of power generation whether it's increased agriculture like more livestock or more power generation by burning coal or natural gas or whatever causes co2 emissions mm -hmm. that that creates co2 and that co2 is keeping heat inside the earth that will eventually hurt the earth in some way and the narrative is that a hot earth will cause sea levels to increase which is usually the the impact they say for like the damages like he quotes 600 trillion dollars in damages from climate impacts which apparently is double the earth's well so i don't really know how that's calculated considering if you stripped away everything anyone has at all it apparently would be half of the damages caused by climate change so i'm not really sure what's happening there but sea level rise because of heated um, oceans not because the ice is melting by the way in case anybody's confused ice already displaces the same amount of water that it would be as water so if you melted the ice caps the the water levels of the ocean would stay the exact same because ice is pushing the water out and once it's gone it is now added to the ocean so it doesn't make any net impact you can see that if you have ice in a cup um once the ice melts it's not higher or lower in the cup it's this the water is the same in the cup because the ice is pushing it up um, but sea levels would rise in theory because the water actually expands as it's heated right slightly very tiny amounts but if you have a ton of water it can it can raise up significantly so that's the 
prediction, the prophecy is that sea levels will rise, that sea levels are already rising. We don't see a lot of that, but again, that's just getting into statistics game. But worst comes to worst, the prediction is that sea levels will rise. This will give us less land because there'll be more sea. Uh, major cities will be disrupted, flooded, um, you name it. That people will have to move away from zones that don't produce enough food because it'll just be too hot to grow certain crops in certain places. There'll be less land to grow food. And two other big factors here are that there's the estimate that the world's population will continue to increase. And therefore, we'll have more mouths to feed. And it's this Malthusian view of the earth that the more people we have, we just can't sustain this indefinite growth in population. So like Thomas Malthus, um, I think it's Thomas Malthus, whatever Malthus in the past believed that by the 1880s, we would um, have mass starvations and other things like that, or some, I'm getting my numbers wrong. Sometime well past where we've crossed now, that there'd be mass starvations that the earth just couldn't produce enough food to feed all humanity over 2 billion people or something. And of course we've fed much more because of agricultural innovations and more people working the ground. But these are all the predictions. So, so mass flooding, less land, climate refugees, more people, poverty, destructions of, of environments and uh, wildlife everywhere because it's too hot. That's what we could be facing. But here's the problem. And maybe you should get into it, Sebastian. It's strangely, distinctly anti-human, which kind of makes me think it's from the anime. But uh, describe what you think the anti-humanness of the current climate panic is. Yeah, so I mean, as you know, the extreme would be that anyone saying that it is Mother Earth trying to get back at us for the evil that we're causing for all the destruction. In some cases, you know, you can see people commenting that how can humans be so wicked, harming animals or destroying ecosystems? Well, that is odd, and you should stick out right away of equal value. Notice I said equal. Not that the other side is significant, but that they are equal in value. And my estimate from that would be, if I may, and then get in a little bit of a tangent, would be from having an evolutionary and materialist worldview. Mm -hmm. It's pretty consistent, I would say, because if you if we if you believe that humans were an accident, and you know, a happy accident, sure, it was an accident. And then monkeys, you know, they also came from from the same ancestors, evolutionary ancestors. Then we really are not that different. We just happen to have been more lucky. So in that sense, it is more consistent. I would criticize the world because it diminishes the value of humans, which goes against the value that God has given us in his revelation that we know from him. So that would be the biggest, the really biggest thing. One of the things that uh, stands in the background for, for this issue, trying to bring up the environment creatures to the same level as humans. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Another one is, it goes to the extreme sometimes of saying that humans are so bad, we should ha stop having kids, so we stop harming the environment. So these are all claims that we're going to tackle in this episode. Yeah. And just with that in mind, I think that's probably the most important thing. And it's almost ubiquitous, at least from what I've seen of climate change alarmists, is they'll push for limiting population or removing population. And there's a lot of motifs in TV shows and movies, if you've seen stuff that's coming out recently, of characters, some, sometimes the good guy, but often the bad guy, that wants to eliminate large portions of the population and that it's good, right? When Thanos in the Avengers kills half of the whole universe's population. It's supposedly for the universe's good. And then it is for the, like, it is good. It is beneficial for the universe, even though everybody's sad, it helps economies and stuff like that, which not to get into economics, but wouldn't, wouldn't work that way when you have half of the work population taken out. Um, it's a net decline in the overall production of the earth because people are good and we produce things. So if you have less of us, there's less things to go on. Not to mention the fact that everyone's made in the image of God. So killing people or having less people <laughs> is a rejection of his mandate. So with all that said, that's the problem we face. And there's Christians that are wrapped up in this, probably because of the political nature of it, but also because we want to love the earth. And a lot of this is pitched as let's save the earth and do these things. We have to remember that a lot of the policies pitched by people who are panicking over this, first of all, they're completely secular. So they don't have a Christian worldview when they're pitching these things, which should always give you a little bit wariness because you don't know what they're missing. Second of all, a lot of the policies impact our neighbors and we are called by God's law to love our neighbors as ourselves. So if, if there's a crazy policy, right, that says that no more kids, right, we have to sterilize everyone. 
well, if we agree with that, we are not loving our neighbors, right? We were born, right? We were born at one point, so we benefited from being alive, and now we're going to cut off all children for everyone, or maybe our neighbor really wants to have kids, and and we're saying we have the right to sterilize them because we're par- you know, paranoid about the climate change crisis. Um, that's that's not loving your neighbor. That's hating your neighbor, right? That's being ungodly. So stand up against policies like that that hurt your neighbor, but also more subtle ones. For example, wanting to tax activities that we believe are polluting can often hurt our neighbors, right? So if we say that cars need to be more expensive because cars hurt the environment because they produce CO2 and demand a bunch of resources or whatever the excuse is to get rid of cars. But if we make cars more expensive, we may be fine because maybe we can afford a car, but those who are just on the cusp of being able to afford or not afford a car, you're depriving them because you supported a particular policy. You're depriving them of a car, which can often deprive them of a job or better food or or whatever they need to support themselves, their family. So you're essentially depriving them of a lot of wealth, especially for the people right in the margins, like the poorest among, among us. So countries like, I remember when I was in Chile, lots of air pollution, right? It was like LA in the, the 1960s, lots of smog because it's in this mountain and they don't have as strict of emissions policies for their cars. And there's a decent amount of cars there. You know, nobody likes smog and smog is much more direct than climate change or anything like that. But the Chilean government, which is all for environmentalism, it's not like they're some super conservative government compared to the United States. They they would not enact the emissions policies that Europe and the United States has, despite the fact that they agree with them, because it would hurt a huge portion of people on the margins in Chile. And Chile, of course, has less GDP than the United States um, and is more comparable to a lot of countries in the earth. If they require cars there to have the same emission standards that Europe and the United States have, people would not be able to afford cars. Some, the elite would, but many citizens who are just trying to make a living or right on the edge of poverty or in poverty, they need the car to make a living, whether they're a taxi driver or a delivery person, or they just need to get to the office, get to the farm, whatever they need. If they can't afford a vehicle, they will be hurt. And therefore, if we prevent them from having a vehicle by even a benign policy that increases the price of cars or gas or whatever, we're hurting our neighbors. So unless unless there's a bigger love for neighbor in actually saving the environment, we we shouldn't do that. And I don't think that car policies like that ultimately save the environment. Which brings us to the real meat of the episode. So we've talked a lot about, you know, kind of ungod related politics and environmentalism. Let's talk about how Christians should view creation. So if those are the ways we shouldn't view creation, right? We shouldn't ignore our neighbor. We shouldn't give in to mass panic. How should we view creation, Sebastian? What has God to say about Earth? Does he even care, you know? Does he even know the earth exists? Who are we? <laughs> yes. Well, he does care. And hence, because he cares, he's all powerful. He has decreed the ends from the beginnings. He created us. He predestined us in love to salvation before the creation of the world through Jesus Christ. Clearly, these words coming from the apostle and throughout the Bible as well, show that God does care about what happens to us as individuals and also as humans, as people. In the beginning, and I'm just kidding, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go from the very beginning. Through the whole yes. thing. Yes. Yeah. When God created uh, heaven and the earth, he put um, Adam in it and he gave a clear picture of what that was going to look like. The Lord God the Lord here is Yahweh, God Elohim, took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And I noted some important words here. What should stick out, it would be work it and take care of it or keep it. So the first word uh, to work it is actually, uh, could be translated as tend, and that would be here in Hebrew, labedach, which actually means to cultivate. So there's an intention here what God is expecting of humans to take care of the garden, which is, you know, have a lot of plants and animals in it, and then keep, take care of it, which would be to preserve. So in the, in the same note for the environment, we're getting a picture of what God expects humans, man in this case, mm-hmm. to do with the environment, to cultivate it and to preserve it. I think it's pretty straightforward thus far. Yeah. And that goes, and it's the creation mandate, right? And this, you'll hear this terminology, stewardship, theology, the creation mandate, if you're ever talking about Christian environmentalism. So we're not going to leave it out. The 
Christian philosophy that has pervaded since Christ was um, did his thing, right? Since Christianity has been around, uh, has been this that the world was made by God. So it's God's creation. And so we shouldn't just spit on it or hate it because it's God's creation. Just like we don't hate um, life because God gave us life. We don't hate our neighbor because he's commanded us not to hate our neighbor. We also don't hate what he has made when it's good. And he said at the point of creation that it was good, right? The sky was good. The earth was good. The ocean was good. The Mm -hmm. birds and the creatures that crawl on the ground and things that um, swim in the sea, they're, they're all good. And the plants and the animals, all creation was good and we were very good. But, not only did God create the earth, so it is good, and we, it is right to want to preserve the earth to cultivate it, like you said. God says this in Genesis 1, 28. God blessed them then and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves in the ground. So this, which comes from the same portion of Genesis that you're talking about, Sebastian, is God explicitly giving mankind its original commandment. Right? And this commandment holds true today. He even gives it in a similar version to Noah when Noah gets off the flood. So it's out of the boat after the flood. So it's not like this was pre-fall and now we've got a post-fall command that's different. This is the general purpose for humanity, at least our, our primary objective here on earth. That is to, one, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, which should run exactly counter to what we were talking about environmentalism that often says that mankind is evil. We should reduce in number shrink on the earth, have more portions of the earth that are wild or reserves or other things like that, and then leave it alone. That subduing it is actually evil. Instead, God says, be fruitful, increase in number, have children, that means fill the earth, so spread out and fill every portion of it and subdue it, which means exactly what you think it means. It means change the earth to your vision, right? To to a good vision, subdue it, not leave it as it is. Yes, what keeps you high. For those that like ancient languages like me, which means actually can be used to bondage, to bring into bondage. So mm-hmm. it's a pretty strong word. And you mentioned also reign dominate, would I do, which rule as a king. Mm-hmm. So so there's two two images here. Dominate it, take care of it, and also preserve it. So it's not just <laughs> reign it like a mad tyrant, like a mad king and just do whatever you want, but be responsible. Hence the name steward theology. Yeah, and we should look to our father who, you know, owns us and was the one that made creation. He owns us like we own the earth, essentially, right? He, of course, owns the earth because he owns us, but he doesn't lord it over us in an evil way, right? He takes care of us, and we're tiny. Even Jesus famously says that father supplies for the sparrow, right? The sparrow doesn't plan or save up anything for the winter, and God provides for the sparrow, so clearly God cares about little things, cares about the wild flowers of the field and all that, so certainly he cares about us. Therefore, if God cares about it, we should also care about the fish that we rule over and the birds of the sky and the living creatures that we rule over. We should care about them and love them like God has loved us, right? And be little images of God running around the earth in that way and not just using it for our own pleasure, but we should be pleasured in ruling over it properly. Right. And as you're saying, Michael, but let's, let's highlight it again. Humans are not equal to animals. Mm-hmm. Now, it might seem obvious for many Christians, but let's just, let's just reiterate, clearly there is a distinct purpose for animals, and then it is for humans. So humans are meant to rule, just like how God rules over us, but responsibly in that sense. Yes, and that is so important. I take it for granted, but to be honest, we can't really these days, especially with the reasons we've said that a lot of people equate us to, to animals because we evolved out of animals, which of course we fundamentally disagree with. But we also, regardless of your position on that, we know the Bible says that while all creation was good, man was very good, and man is specifically prohibited from killing man from the very outset, whereas we are allowed and commanded to kill animals. I, some will find that very offensive because they find killing animals offensive, Christians alike, uh, for whatever reason. Christians have often fallen prey to the thought that killing animals is evil. However, remember that God proscribes it in the law, right? So, when God demands sacrifices for sin, he demands animal sacrifice, which disturbs a lot of people. In fact, funny to me, because I think there's lots of quote-unquote objectionable things to think about uh, the Old Testament God, right? The true living God that he did, right? That he commanded the killing of peoples, the Canaanites and the wicked peoples, and that he um, didn't allow homosexuality, whatever, you know, whatever your thing is that he didn't like, that's offensive to you. 
one of the most offensive things that I've heard people react to is the fact that God demands animal sacrifice. They find that to be just absolutely barbaric bloodletting. Why would he cause the killing of animals for his own pleasure? And first of all, fundamentally misunderstands the reason for the sacrifice, but also it misvalues animals in a way that they aren't. Animals are for the use of man and the pleasure of God, right? Just like we're for the use of God and the pleasure of God. Like he can do whatever he wants with us. He's just nice. So we should be nice to animals, but we've been commanded or we were commanded to sacrifice animals. So clearly they are not held in the same esteem as men. Right. Just important to keep in mind. Yeah. And speaking of the law, I want to quickly touch on this. We know that God does not ignore creation. I quoted Jesus about the sparrow and the wildflowers of the field. And you probably know that verse if you've read your Bible, know the New Testament. But what most people don't realize, remember, or know because they haven't read it is God's law. So Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Judges, er, Deuteronomy, not Judges. Uh, that's his law. He gives it to the Israelites for how they ran Israel. And, and I think it's applicable to us today, especially portions of it. A lot of the law has to do with how they treat the land. And while a lot of that has to do with loving your neighbor and making sure that you're not um, like killing his animals, right? Or, or leaving pits around for his animals to fall into that he loses value. I, there's, there's portions of it that also are just strictly for the land. For instance, this is Exodus 23. He says, you shall sow your land for six years and gather its yield. But on the seventh year, you shall let it rest and lie fallow so that the needy of your people may eat. So there's the needy of your people. It's benefiting people, but also... And whatever they leave, the needy of the people leave, the beast of the field may eat. You are to do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. So this shows you that that he cares about the wild beasts of the field, right? He also says, the very next paragraph, six days you are to do work, but on the seventh day you shall cease from labor so that your ox and your donkey may rest and the son of your female slave as well as your stranger may refresh themselves. So you can see that love of neighbor is always in there, but also love of animals, whether it's your worked domesticated animal, your ox, your donkey, but also the wild beasts of the field that are eating from your fallow field. So like clearly God does care about animals and here's the kind of prescriptions that they have for caring for them, right? Allow them to eat, allow them to rest, but never at the sacrifice of your neighbor's well-being, right? The first and foremost reason for keeping your field fallow was for the needy of the people and for your own rest. Same goes for resting on the seventh day. It's for your donkey and your ox, sure, it's for yourself as well. It's also for the stranger, your slave, and, you know, the son of your slave. Yeah. Also, uh, okay. interesting enough, same chapter of Exodus. Um, the the Lord talks about how he's going to give the Israelites this land. And here's an important and often looked over verse from God when he's telling the Israelites he's going to give them the land. He says, I will send hornets ahead of you so that they will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites before you. So here's God saying he's going to use creation, right? Not even some super special portion of creation, just hornets. We all hate hornets. Well, God's sending them out to drive out these evil peoples. But, and here's, I think, the more important part. He says, I will not drive them out before you in a single year, that the land may not become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. I will drive them out before you little by little until you you can become fruitful and take possession of the land. Now, that's really interesting because, first of all, it's just kind of odd that he would give this stipulation that he's not going to drive them out all at once because they're wicked people and kind of the whole reason they're coming there is to kick out these people. But even though they're wicked and should be removed right away, it's worse that they would be driven out quickly and that the land would become desolate and the beasts of the field would take over because, and proven here, I think, by God's own reasoning— men are good for land. Even the wicked men, right? The wicked Canaanites who are doing wicked and detestable things because they own the land and were cultivating it and taking care of it, they were benefiting the land that would eventually be given to Israelites. So men are good. Wherever we go, we're not misusing the land, even wicked people. And I mean, there's, there's cases where we do kill all life or something like that, but they're pretty few and far between. Regular use of the land is not a bad thing. It is a good thing. And when we leave areas wild, the beasts come and make it desolate, right? It's not useful. It's even bad for the beasts. Like, it's just bad land because the earth wasn't made to be without men. I think that's the the end of this thing is that, well, many secular environmentalists believe that the earth thrived before man. We know that God made the earth for man to be in it, right? It was always designed to have man cultivating it. Now, that will bring, you know, some interesting arguments to, you know, should we have, some areas left untouched for like reservations 
Well, you know, if you think about reservations in the United States, kicked off uh-huh. by um, good old teddy bear uh, Roosevelt, they are cultivated, essentially. They're managed by park rangers. We manage trails. We usually manage the brush. We manage the populations oh, yeah. that are in them, the bear and, and deer and other wildlife populations of them. So they're, they're less of wildlife, like wild untamed lands and more like a very large park because that's that's what they are right yellowstone park they are reservations to preserve nature but they are in the good way i would say that's a good way of preserving nature in that we're we're keep we're taking care of the land right there's people taking care of it pruning it keeping it pretty Mm -hmm. and it's not just for looks too it's like animals benefit from human cultivation that's what i think the the thing that nobody thinks about or agrees with or realizes people make places better for animals. We think about us cutting down, you know, Brazilians cutting down large portions of the rainforest. And yes, we can hurt environments. It's not like it's impossible for everything that man does is beneficial for the environment. But by and large, uh, people make way more food than animals could ever get. So when we create food offshoots, I mean, think about seagulls. Seagulls like benefit from humanity greatly because what do they do? They pretty much purely eat uh, human food, at least on the coast. They eat fish too, right? In the wild, but they... They benefit greatly from mankind, and we benefit from seagulls, whether you like to admit or not, because we um, mine their guano, their bird poop, for fertilizer. And in fact, it was like so precious, especially in the 1800s before they had other chemical fertilizers, that countries were claiming tiny rocky islands purely because of all the bat, uh, bird poop on them so that they could get the guano off and ship it. And it was like super important. It was um, very expensive to get the guano. So... <laughs> We're symbiotic, right? We're, we're meant for each other to, to serve each other. And again, while not every human action benefits the environment, by and large, we do. To think that Peru and Chile went also in war, part of some guano, some bird poop. There you go. Going to war, some bird poop. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There you go. Uh, one last thing I want to say just from the scriptures is that we know that God also, and maybe this gets to human everything that humans do doesn't always benefit the environment. It's not like... Oh, that is 100% of the case. We know it today, but we also know that God gives uh, blessings and curses to the people of Israel. He gives a list amount. He says, if you follow me and obey me as your Lord, your God, here's all the blessings you're going to get. And a lot of those blessings have to do with, of course, they have to do with health and having lots of babies and being happy, all right, and not being invaded and being successful. But they also often have to do with the land. Um, the land, of course, feeds them, but it also just like a nice land, right? There's, there's, it's, fruitful it's beautiful um there's often rain and grass is nice you know all the good stuff right likewise there's curses on the people of israel which we know they they ended up getting these curses the curses on the people of israel include unrelated to environment things like diseases and war and unhappiness and invasion and all that type of stuff but a lot of them have to do with the land being cursed right they inhabit the land they disobey god the land gets cursed he brings drought we all know the famous drought from elijah's time that he's um, it's lasting so long that uh, it's a curse and the, the nation is freaking out and the king is wanting him to stop the, the drought because it knows it's from God. That drought is from God and predicted here. He says he's going to give it as a curse. So droughts can be just straight from God. People disobeying God, it could be nothing they're doing on the earth that's particularly causing the drought. God gives gives it. He also brings in wild animals to drive them out like those hornets that drove out the Canaanites. He curses the grounds that it's hard as iron. It says in Deuteronomy 28, in the, uh, the sky over your head will be bronze and the ground beneath you will be iron. The Lord will turn the rain of your country into dust and powder. It will be come down from the skies until you are destroyed. So we know that God can curse the land because of a people's wickedness. So for instance, let me give a kind of controversial take. The Soviet Union is not often talked about, but is notoriously anti the environment, not by not by dictate. They weren't like, oh, we hate the earth, so we're going to destroy it. But because they're by and large a wicked people, they decided to, and they hated God is really what I mean. They despise God as a, a anti-God regime, not just a no-God regime, an anti-God regime. Their policies destroyed the earth right? They produce tons of real pollution, right? Dead wildlife by the millions, polluted rivers, dying people, less food production, big smoggy smokestacks um, of cheap, badly produced iron, badly produced uh, nuclear plants, as we all know, Chernobyl, right? Like big swaths of things that destroyed the environment by their ineptitude, surely, but also, I think, because of the curse of God that God gives to 
evil peoples that eventually the land rebels against them and hurts them. Right up the Aral Sea. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It caused extreme desertification in Central Asia. Oh, oh my goodness. Yeah, and that's why I think it's such an offense when environmentalists say, oh, Mother Earth is getting back at us for all our CO2. First of all, I highly doubt CO2 is the really biggest thing that she she's angry about. Second of all, it's it very well might be judgment, right? It like so if they're discerning that a big hurricane that wipes out a portion of a city could be judgment from God, right? So when they when they see the judgment, they see the hand of judgment and what we should be doing is repenting and saying, God, you know, we repent for our wickedness because it's your judgment and we know that it's you who brought it. Instead, they're going, "Oh, it's Mother Earth, and maybe if I just buy another Prius, you know, that's going to keep them from coming. So it's it's taking God's righteous judgment and attributing it to some false goddess with false um, sacrifices you can make to, to make her happy. Yeah, same goes for diseases. And I think it's on the same note as using the environment, like, fam like the famous passage that we all know and love from Isaiah, woe to Assyria, you know, how he uses the king, even though the king is willing, more than happy to come in and kill everybody in Israel. He's actually being used by God. But afterwards, what is the punishment for the king and his army? To send a blight, a disease, to ravage the army. The disease came from God. The plagues of Egypt, frogs, flies, hail, pestilence, they came from God. Mm -hmm. So as you're saying, you know, the very well calamities could very well be a, I mean, you have to balance. So you can't just say, Everything, absolutely everything has come from God as judgment, because we live, we do live in a fallen, in a fallen world. So you just have to balance as well between those two things. Yeah, and even you know, we know God controls all things, right? So nothing came without His watch, but it's not necessarily right. in judgment, like you said. And we don't know, you know, what His purposes for the judgment are. So hard to say. Oh, you know, Hurricane Katrina was because of the wickedness of Louisiana, which people said at the time could you know it's possible and if there's any fruit from people repenting in louisiana that's great but we don't know all of god's reasoning or or necessarily any of his reasoning for bringing stuff like that all right so we've gone on big length we've talked about our problems with environmentalism we've talked about the christian response which is essentially love god love neighbor love his creation right in that order don't don't ignore people don't hate people love god first and foremost and obey him and therefore go out and subdue the earth and the people are actually good for the earth if we treat it properly yeah i would say if you love god as a consequence of that you're going to show the fruits of the spirit for yes. more information please check our episode <laughs> gotta reference it thanks for remembering sebastian i gotta reference our other episodes we have over 50 episodes now can you believe that it's a lot of episodes all right so with all that said well, I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, there is a lot like a disturbing. I, I was kind of disturbed, disturbing about, it, especially in here in Minnesota, maybe because it's more of a blue state of regular, real, genuine Christians. They're not fake cultural Christians, to my understanding, that are really caught up in all the doomsday environmental stuff. And I, I had heard this from some of the people in my church, Sebastian, and you were even bringing it up before the episode. There are some that equate global warming and other things like that to revelational apocalypse. <laughs> yes. Yes, and the one that I've heard here is from Revelation 16. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. And that's what people have heard cited as reference to global warming. Does yeah. that sound like global warming to you? Yeah. And I... I, it's not like that's just a wacker out of that believes that. I've heard people say that with no influence from Sebastian or some other weird resources. They just genuinely think, oh, that sounds like global warming to me, which, not to get in a soapbox, but <laughs> what? No, uh, no climate scientist, even the most fanatical weirdo, unless maybe, maybe the most fanatical weirdo, but I've never been in a conversation with very strong believing secular um, climate people that they'll ever l admit that the the outcome of climate change will be total desertification, scorching men, scorching men. Are you kidding me? Like some laser beam? Like that's clearly not man cause climate change. Sorry, four degrees isn't going to be scorching you like a laser beam. That's judgment from God, right? I think that's pretty exclusive. Yes, yes. It says it came from it came from came from from him, like you know, just like the plagues, and it seems like a very exceptional moment when he allows the angel to pour a symbolic bowl on the sun 
to allow people to burn. So yes, it is not the same thing as what people say is a man-made uh, global, global warming and climate change. So clearly this is a very exceptional, unique to the, to the end times. They take those um, pictures of the earth on fire and they take it literally. That's what I think the outcome is. <laughs> Anyways, uh, there's also like, um, there's revelational revelation prediction that says that a third of the oceans will turn to blood and a third of the fish will die, uh -huh. which some people will say, oh, well, if the oceans acidify, which is, could be a result of global warming, then fish will die because it's more acidic or the oceans could become deoxygenated by large blooms of red algae, which has happened, can happen. Uh, but two things, the acidification of the oceans, it's a really slow process first and foremost. So I highly doubt that it would cause a third of the fish to die. Like, on some grand apocalyptic scale. And then secondly, there'd be no blood in that situation. If it's the algae thing, right, that can kill local populations of fish. So if it was big ocean wide, I suppose that could be something. So I'm not ruling it out from God's toolbox, but we have to realize that that's not really a global warming thing. That's algae blooms, big massive algae blooms are influenced by large amounts of fertilizer being introduced into the ocean by, by rivers that pour in and they get a ton of fertilizer from the farms that run into the river. And so that ends up getting out of the ocean. And so it's usually confined to river deltas and those river deltas have a lot of fertilizer in them so that it, it breeds a lot of algae. And then that algae um, consumes all the oxygen in the water and then the water is too unoxygenated for the fish to live so they either leave or they die that happening on a massive scale is going to be really hard but even if it did it would be from fertilizer or some sort of food like flour or something thrown into the ocean not global warming so there you go but that was a side tangent we should really talk about sebastian another thing choice you know i feel more comfortable eating vegetables, not eating meat, just eating fish, you name, you name, name vegan or vegetarian, you name it. So citing from first Corinthians says, it goes on saying that, you know, if my, if eating meat causes my brother to stumble, then I would not eat meat in front of them. I'm paraphrasing here. And that is the same logic as well for a uh, for vegetarians. So if, for a, as a conscience issue, they decided to not to not eat meat, and they would rather just eat vegetables. Then, likewise, we should respect that decision. So that is a, an argument cited, and but rather than necessarily, how do they how do they justify you know that saying that it's okay because uh, Paul speaks here against uh, eating meat. The the re, the background behind it is that. From the beginning in Genesis, a, vegeta a Christian vegeta vegeta vegetarian, excuse me, would say that it was better when God created uh, Adam and Eve, and that animals and humans only ate plants. And then later, God said to Noah, "Okay, now you can eat meat that's uh, with without blood." Mm -hmm. So the argument is that okay, clearly, it was better then. Clearly, that's how God made the earth. So rather than eating meat, which came after, why don't we just go back to the very beginning? That is the, that is the argument. So I'll, I'll let you respond. If, do you have an initial response to either of those positions? You, uh, we talked about this before. You know my position on the, the Corinthians one. Yes. Yeah, so we'll say the Corinthians one. For the, for the one on the referring to, to Genesis and the creation, I think that it is a little bit odd because God and Jesus, Jesus did make all the foods clean. So it is not as if one is worse than the other, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It is not as if meat is worse than plants. Um, clearly, the situation that we're in is different than the situation that Adam and Eve were pre-fall, so uh -huh. we can't equate. Same with the will. We cannot say, okay, yes, Adam and, Eve, Adam and Eve had, that's the argument, had free will. Thus, we now have free will because clearly we live in the same world as they did. No, not the case. So, different scenario, I would, I would say. And on that same note, Jesus spoke in Mark, let me find it. Mark 7. 
declares all foods clean. And Jesus said the following, listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. And his disciples failed to understand. So once they are alone with Jesus, they ask him. And then Jesus explains, do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile since it enters not the heart but the stomach and goes out in the sewer? It is what comes out of a person that defiles for it is from within, from the human heart that evil intentions come. And then later, you know, here it's that contradicting the the, pur the purpose of this passage was contradicting the Pharisees, all the rules that they had set up, and Jesus declares all, Mark notes that Jesus declared all foods clean mm -hmm. from this. So no weird rules, no exceptions, no dietary customs. He fulfilled the law from the Old Testament, so we can eat shrimp, we can eat... Uh, bats. Probably shouldn't eat bats. <laughs> probably should not. <laughs> hey, no, I, I, I would disagree. I think it's clean. I mean, of course, you want to cook it, right? right? And I think... Um, yeah. Some of the bad eating practices are when they keep the blood in, which I think is just general sanitary. You know, you can't, you don't have to refrain from eating the bat, but maybe you should refrain from eating it with blood in it, like the apostles requested, and as it was always done, except for pagan society. So there are ways to eat things, right, that are clean and not clean, like eating a bat raw, for instance, without cooking it, or anything raw for that matter. Again, there are methods to eating, but I think the food itself is, is clean. Right, even right. A bat. So. Even a bat. I know it's coronavirus, but eating a bat, man. If you cooked it, it's. Have you ever seen? This is a. This is a crazy tangent. Maybe I shouldn't even say it. But if you've seen <laughs> soups, especially Asian soups for whatever reason, they often they undercook that meat. They often undercook that meat, man. You ever seen pho? Pho is like a, a big soup thing, especially here in Minnesota because there's so many um uh, Vietnamese Hmong people. But um, it's like they always like. Have you ever seen the pork on pho? It is raw, baby. Like they put they put it raw. I don't know how they cook it, to be honest, but it looks very pink. So, eh, you know, I can kind of see how eating a cooked bat in the soup might um, hurt you. Yeah, that was a big tangent, but yes, yes, yes. Something that Jesus ate was fish. Mm -hmm. Clearly from Luke 24. So to prove that he was actually there in physical, physical form, he asked, do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. And ichthus prosimon to eat. Ichthus, ichthuos means fish. So yeah, clearly <laughs> he just ate. questioning, he ate the fish. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's, it's like maybe like looking at it, consuming. No, it's like consumption. So yes, he, he savored that tasty fish. So. Jesus ate, Jesus ate fish, so other than plants. Part of the argument is that, you know, God prefers plants over animals. Well, clearly, Jesus is God, and he just ate fish. Mm -hmm. And as you were also mentioning before the, the uh, podcast, Michael, that during the Passover, he ate the, he ate the lamb. Yeah. Now, there's not a passage like that one where it tells him that... The... You know, and then Jesus put the lamb chop into his mouth or something like that. But they had a lamb, a Passover lamb. He tells them to prepare the last Passover lamb. The assumption is they ate it, right? That's pretty normal. It would be weird if he didn't, right? You'd think they'd put it down if he didn't eat it. And that's to show that maybe you're like a pescatarian or something, meaning you only eat fish and that's you've somehow decided that that's what is better. But know that pre-fall, so pre, you know, in the garden, if your mm -hmm. reasoning is that we're trying to get back to that day, they didn't eat fish back then either. So you eating fish now is kind of weirdly hypocritical. But more importantly, like I think you pointed out, Sebastian, I I think that this is borderline, if not outright idolatry and d more dangerous than other weird rules that people can make up for themselves. Of course, I would disadvocate. I would not advocate for any extra rules that are extra biblical for ourselves, right? Because why are we doing that? We're just doing what the Pharisees did. We're just adding extra rules, extra loops. So why would you add an eating practice to the rules when you don't need to? But more importantly, the Bible directly addresses this. It's not It's not like this is a, a weird issue the Bible doesn't address and maybe we can excuse ourselves for making a weird rule in it. The Bible says explicitly, Jesus made all foods clean. And it's not like he did that on a passing because we all know that Peter in Acts it gets a whole vision about eating all clean food. So it's pretty important that we know that all foods are clean. I think 
primarily because of the Jewish Gentile split, but also I think in general, we shouldn't be making um, foods clean or not clean anymore. God made them all clean. So we, <laughs> we are straight up disobeying God when we do that. And maybe I'll give my take on the Corinthians passage. The Corinthian passage is pretty famously because people apply it to a lot of things these days and always have is about people in Corinth eating meat in the city and meat in the city was always sacrificed to idols because that's how the butchers did it. They, they gave a sacrifice and then took the meat just like the Israelites did back then except the Israelites um, sacrificed to Yahweh. These were sacrificed to false idols. So Paul says it's clean meat. You can eat that meat. It's not unclean for you to eat meat that was sacrificed to an idol because the idol's fake. You know, it's it's just meat. You know, God made all food clean. That's the argument. However, he says there are those in your company that used to, they were old idolaters. Notice they were they were old idolaters. Not just randos that decided it was unclean to eat meat. <laughs> they were old idolaters that used to worship those gods that those meats were sacrificed to. They know that that meat was sacrificed to Zeus or whoever. And so when they eat that meat, they are tempted to go back into Zeus worship, right? Because they used to be a Zeus worshiper. I think a couple important points to note. Those brothers, I don't think, at least it doesn't say, didn't get angry at those who were eating meat. They didn't say it wasn't a Christian freedom to eat meat. They didn't, um, essentially, they, they weren't sinning, the, the idolaters, that is, the, one, the previous idolaters, the ones that Paul is worried about, they weren't sinning actively by not eating meat, right? They weren't, they didn't have some big sin problem that people were putting up with. They were just tempted. They were put at tempted positions, tempting positions when they ate meat sacrificed to idols with the brothers. So Paul's recommendation is don't. Don't even make it an issue, right? Like these people are tempted. We're trying to help them get away from this temptation. They are also trying to get away from this temptation. Let's not have them eat meat. That rationale is often used to promote lots of things in the church um, that I don't think it should. For example, the mask issue. I, I don't really care about masks. A lot of people, there are some on the Christian rights conservatives that are like, oh, the mask is a symbol of, you know, universal health care and can't have it you know it's like taking the mark of the beast yeah i I disagree (laughs) i don't think it's that big of a deal but there's an equal amount if not more people on the opposite side saying that if you don't wear a mask you're trying to kill me and you're not loving me and i'm a weak christian brother and i'm basically like the person in corinth that used to be an idolater and i need (laughs) you to wear the mask because you're making me sin by not having the mask i i want to make it very clear the mask issue, and you can immediately apply this to the vegan issue because it's pretty much the exact same argument. If you have a problem, a giant problem, right, and you are going to be mad at your brother because he's not doing what you want, and it's not a biblical issue, you have the problem, right? The mask wearer that is freaking out that his brother won't wear the mask, he has the problem. And the one, same with the vegan. It's not a biblical command to be vegan. I would, I would even say it's biblical uncommanded to be vegan, right? All feeds are clean, so you should eat them all. You have the problem, vegan person, right? You cannot make your brother go and do that. You're the one being unloving. And I don't think we should put up with sin like that. Which is, It's different than the Corinthian scenario because the Christians that were that had a propensity to sin when eating idol meat weren't actively sinning. Whereas we should be calling out the sin of angry vegan brothers and sisters who believe that meat is not clean because they are wrong. They're denying, I think, a pretty core New Testament truth that Jesus revealed. So we shouldn't be coddling that. Now, is it something to break a church over? No, but I I just don't think the Corinthian things applies. And in fact, I think it is borderline, if not straight idolatry, to say that meat is unclean because it's like you're making a new God that has new commands because we know that God explicitly made all food clean. Anyways, there you go. Off my soapbox. Right, right. So I would say, you know, that is pretty much where you would draw the line. For me, what I would struggle with is what if you don't want to eat certain certain foods for a because it might actually violate your conscience, like the way certain uh, companies operate. Let's just say a, a classic one that everyone likes to the video of the you know the swimming around the slaughterhouse and then being like thrown to be uh, executed or whatnot. Yeah, the Tyson chicken and plant. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, or the chick- or the chicken plant as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the um, the ar- the argument would be, you know, it viol- it violates my conscience. I do, I, I am generally disturbed at the way these people are treating those those animals. You're asking me, I and mean, yeah, so, I think you're justified in doing yeah, that yeah. car, right? But that see, that's totally different. So if you, I I think it's totally Christian. There's not no problem if you make a particular kind of food like i'm just not gonna eat that it's not unclean i just don't want to eat it like 
I'm boycotting Tyson or whatever because I don't agree with their practices, so I'm just not going to buy their chicken, right? That that doesn't say things about the chicken. It says things about Tyson. You just don't want to give Tyson your business. Okay, I mean, you're entitled to. Like, we can agree to disagree on that one. Um, I, I mean, I might disagree with how they treat their chickens. I don't really know how they treat their chickens because I don't really watch those kind of things. I, I don't think it's that big of a deal because, again, they are chickens after all. But I think if, you, if you're operating a plant like that you should be nice to your you know make it as swift deaths as possible and make the conditions good enough for the chickens right i mean you don't need to pamper them like little chihuahuas because they are for food and if you make your chicken too expensive to make you're going to end up hurting your neighbor so i think there's balance there but Uh you know unnecessarily cruel to animals is nothing that i would support however if you like are on a diet and you're like okay well cheeto i really like cheetos so i'm just gonna you know not have cheetos i'm not gonna eat cheetos because if i eat cheetos i'm gonna start eating a bunch of cheetos and it's and i'm gonna gain weight and i'm trying to not gain weight i don't mm-hmm. think there's idolatry in that per se because you're not saying cheetos are unclean you're just saying i don't want to eat cheetos because it's too many calories okay you know that's fine and of course if you're allergic to something well then <laughs> of course you can cut that food out because it's gonna hurt you right but barring any of those reasons to cut out food as a whole you know like if you say I don't like Tyson chicken because they mis- they mistreat it, but then you also refuse to eat your own chicken or like you know chicken raised ethically or whatever, then you're, you know, your argument is mute because you really don't eat chicken because you think it's unclean, not because they mistreated it. Interesting. Okay. So that's how you would draw the comparison as well, and how it ties back, you know, to the incorrect view, and it comes down to idolatry. Yeah, I mean, it is what the Pharisees did, right? Making all these extra rules. And the same thing goes for environmentalism. Like, there are good, godly ways to treat the environment, and not all of them are explicitly laid out in God's law or other parts of the Bible. So I understand that it's a nuanced issue, and there might be things like scrubbing sulfur dioxide from the atmosphere that I would be behind and I think is a good way to love your neighbor. And even though it makes power marginally more expensive or whatever it does the harm is just too big so i understand the arguments from the global warming side i understand the arguments from the vegan but we have to first of all for the vegan thing i already given all the reasons that that i don't think it's proper but for the environmentalist the christian environmentalist that's concerned about environmentalism global warming style uh, you really have to weigh what hurts your neighbor more than it helps and that that's that's where i think you can end up with an idol that says thou shall not produce co2 and that overrides hurting your neighbor, right? And God never said that, so you shouldn't. He did say, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And that's what I think we should be doing. So uh, let's wrap Sebastian with this final thing. I know we've been going for a while, mostly me ranting. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> let's wrap up. How would you recommend somebody, so if, if we're convicted in that it's bad to be a fanatic about global warming and be worried about uh, impending apocalypse or making an idol out of veganism, whatever it is, how would you recommend approaching somebody like that, whether it's a Christian or a secular person? How would you do it? Mm -hmm. At first, if actually, if it's someone that you care about, uh, rather present the gospel, if it's someone who is an atheist, secular, whatever, you name it. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would advise for that change of heart when you come in. So for the moment, avoid those statistics what you want to ask is and this is we getting more on the theological aspect okay so what okay why does it why does it matter that the earth gets uh, it's getting warmer okay what's going to happen mm-hmm. why is it important for, that would be more for a secularist i would say because then you can then you can use that as a as a topic to then speak about why things matter why things have value, yeah. why we should even care about the environment or other humans. Like, okay, I'm like, if we're materialists, I should just consume all the gas in the world, just to get all, turn the AC all the way up, turn, you know, just drive a sports car 24 seven. I'm going to die. So I'm better make the most out of it. Like, why do I care about the future generations mm-hmm. if you're a materialist? So clearly people don't operate like that. Even the most, uh, Ravaging or yeah, staunch, staunch do, but yeah. Okay, okay, yes, yes. Most, most don't. So I would say that I use that as a transition to talk about now. Bring up the gospel, how Jesus, how only God can give value to people. That would be for a secularist. I would say a good transition to the gospel. For a Christian, I would be more gentle than a. I would lean more on the gentle side because it is a brother and sister in Christ. You know, we're going on that basis. So keep that in mind. And 
you don't want to create unnecessary divisions for this because this isn't this isn't something to throw anathemas over i would say this is mm -hmm. not a gospel issue if they talk about mother earth then that might be a gospel issue let's assume not so for a christian i would actually ask why why are you worried about this and as i mentioned in a bible study once is your work is your worry bigger than God? So like, why why are you worrying so much? And you're trusting God, excuse me. So if you're seeing Revelation as a pinnacle of global warming, you know how the sun's going to burn us all, going to be scorched, there's going to be plagues everywhere. Okay. Isn't that the hand of God? Hasn't God decreed the end from the beginnings? Isn't that part of his doing? Isn't that part of his will, part of his plan, that all of this has to be fulfilled before Christ returns? And I would lean more on, I I would lean more on that conversation because then we can talk about um, how we need to be more aware, more mindful that God is in control of these things. It is not uh, something that we should be panicking over. If we panic, that means... That, that would say that's a hard issue. That's what a pastor would say. Mm -hmm. Because then you're putting your worry over, over God. You're focusing more. You're, abandon, you're abandoning a lot of reason and just completely panicking, searing in. We have to stop carbon emissions. We have to do this policy. We have to, as you were saying, increase taxes on cars. But, but why? You're, why are you so narrow down in that? So I would, I would say, let's take a step back. Don't blast anyone yet, unless you know they are they're as unless they're asking for it. And then lean, I would fo I would focus more on that on that. Are you trusting God more? Do you do you have that? Oh, you're gonna hate it. Do you have that relationship with God that you should be? That you Maybe should hate's be a strong word, but yes, I got you. Yeah, yeah. So I would focus more on that on the trust in God with a Christian. Because I think it is mostly uh, a mild sense of panic. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much 100% agree with you, especially with the secularist. It's not, unless you're running for president and you're in a formal debate and you need to like shut down his argument, I don't think it's really worth making a deal of it. It should really just be a springboard to sharing the gospel. If you're having a conversation like that, it's you know, emotional because they usually care about it. Um, and it has to do with politics, I would immediately point it to the king of all kings, Jesus Christ, right? Why does anything care at all? Uh, why does anything matter to, at all to the secularist and even to the non-Christian who maybe has a foundation, if a false foundation for truth, point it right back to to God. Like you, you don't really need to have the environmental conversation again unless they're actively about to put in a policy and you need to like stand in the way of some evil policy or something like that. There's not a lot of reason to make that an issue. For a Christian, I'm also in agreement with you. The... The reason I wouldn't bring up all the statistics is just because of the reasons we said at the outset of this podcast. There's a lot of quoting you can do. There's a ton of statistics. I mean, I personally think that there are statistics that prove that it's not a big deal, but they equally have like many, many statistics that they think it is a big deal. And so you end up with like a some science data analysis, which really isn't the root of the problem. Like that's not what most people weren't convinced by um, straight reason on either side for the it being an issue or not an issue, you have to get right to the heart of the issue, which is outcome and policies. Like, that's what I would say. What, what do you think the outcome is? And you said it, Sebastian, yourself. What do you think the outcome is if this is all happening? So I would, I would seed their point theoretically, right? So, okay, so if carbon emissions are creating a global temperature increase and the global temperature increase is bad for the earth, what are the outcomes? And then what policies are you suggesting? Because with both of those, you get at the trust issue, right? Of the outcomes. Like, what, what do you think the outcomes are? Are you thinking that it will cause apocalypse that, that God wasn't planning for? Because that's a trust issue, right? You get straight to the, hey, brother, like, there's something you need to work through there. And the policy one, like, are you promoting Green New Deal or, or even mild stuff like, like cap and trade and other things that might limit uh, cost, cost poor people more money? I think that's a perfect time to say something they probably haven't thought about. And that is, hey you know that's going to hurt like the poorest among us i think we should really be we should really really consider the pains of that before we say that it benefits society right and that out of love for the neighbor because they're your christian brother's trying to love his neighbor by caring for the environment 
but he's just misled. Right. And, you know, it might seem pretty obvious, you know, saying this, and okay, what, who oh, no. He's pointing out, they're going to say, thanks, Michael, for pointing out the obvious, but it's not that easy to, it's always it's easy to forget, I would say, because just as I was coming back from the dentist, a car that I saw, and this, this relates, this relates to what we're talking about, it had a lot of bumper stickers, you know, for, a, clearly this person was a Democrat, mm-hmm. I'll say that, and one of them was Tim Waltz, you know, had governor of Minnesota, Democrats, so look at that. And then I thought, well, there are many people that would get angry at seeing that. It's like, oh man, those clowns over, you know, whatever. You know, some people probably react that way at the car. Or, oh, that guy's probably, that guy's probably a commie. You know, whatever, <laughs> whatever insults yeah, like that. Uh-huh. Yeah, I would say those are, I would say those reactions are unChristian. My first reaction, and you know, I just realized I processed it through. It's like, this must be very important for that person. That being said, likewise, these issues are important to those people that are bringing about it. We agree that they're going about it the wrong way. They're proposing some strange solutions, but nonetheless, they are important. They matter. They have meaning to these people, atheists or Christian. And we know, we spoke about it earlier, God, and in, the, in previous episodes, we're made in the image of God. Uh-huh. So, episode 50, you want to go look at that one. It's our first video yes. episode. Yes. So, you know, pretty pretty obvious to say, you know, just talk, talk about these things, bring up the gospel. Yeah, but take take the step back and know, realize, internalize. These people are, are valuable. They are made in the image of God. And this really matters to them. Mm-hmm. I think when you go with that mindset, it really changes the approach. You know, it's, it might say it sounds like stating the obvious, but I think it actually makes a huge difference in processing it. Uh, when I, when I thought of it uh, coming coming back here, it, it's going to make a huge difference in your tone, in your approach. What are you going to talk about? Are you going to destroy, blast the other person? Or are you actually going to present the gospel because you care about the, their salvation? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, even Paul cited that he wished, he asked, you know, I wish I would be damned myself to hell so that my brethren, the Jews, would be saved. Mm-hmm. Like, that's how much he cared for those people. So I think that's that's the attitude of our conversations for these issues. I mean, Paul did care about because it was a gospel issue, but nonetheless, for Christians, we should care too because they are brothers and sisters. Let's have that compassion and attitude to it. Talk this through. Let's get to the issues at hand, which would be trust, could be uh, not a correct view of love for brother, you name it. So yeah. have that nice attitude. And that's why it's really important that where you're based, right? Christians should be based on God's. If we ever come off that founding, we should move right back on. Seculars, of course, are on the, the wrong boat. They should move on the right boat. And that's why we have found our cause in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been Michael, the man behind the machine, and to my virtual friend has been... Sebastian, the bookkeeper. We ran super long today, but hopefully you enjoy the longer episode than normal. I think it's an important issue. If you want to see the rest of our episodes, you can go to foundcause.com forward slash... No. Found out foundcause.podbean.com for us. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's the, the thing. That's where you go to find the rest of our episodes and download them at your listening pleasure. You can also go to Spotify, look us up on iTunes, or find us on Facebook forward slash found cause, or you can go to YouTube and search up found cause. We're everywhere, Sebastian, except for the places that we aren't. We're also on Twitter, so add us at found underscore cause. Until next time, we talk about something completely different. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.